first reading is taken from Isaiah, chapter 62, 1 through 5. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in your hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm uh, is taken from Psalm 128, uh, read responsibly. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, the flesh of the man be blessed, the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon the heart of Glory, Glory be to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. <clears throat> to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, and another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord.
according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding of his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out, and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, they did not know where it came from, although the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and when, good, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of the signs Jesus did in Cana and Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. <laughs> Why he did that? We had a few of them. 
I found seven. Let me share them with you, okay? We need to unpack this story and find the nugget that John inserted for us as we live our life of faith. And the story goes something like this. I just read it. This seems like the one, by the way. Oh I think Satan puts these together. <laughs> just slow us down a little bit, you know. Sorry, Carl. It just doesn't work. But it's working out a little bit, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Three days after Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, they're invited to a wedding reception. A wedding and a reception, actually. His mother and him and his disciples. <clears throat> no reason why. We don't even know who the bridegroom and bride is. We don't know that. That's not the story. It could have been a relative. It could be a dear friend, probably. But we're not told. So we just kind of speculate on that one. But weddings were different in those days. Very, very different. Not like our weddings. You know, when I was in college, I went to the University of Wisconsin, and so we were on uh, what, what we call a starvation diet. Now it doesn't look like that now. But back in those days, whoa, we didn't have much. And so we would always check the social pages of the <laughs> register. They call it the register. And we look at real often, Steve. You know what I'm going to say? You know what I'm going to say? But we, we looked at the good weddings. And You'd never go to the Protestant weddings. The Methodists, you kidding me? Little nuts and mix and, and little mint candies, you know, afterwards. You, why would you want to eat that? And back in those days, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you, some of you, well, all of you are my age, so most of you are, you know, we didn't have plastic bags. We had wax paper. We'd line our coats. And I never wore a sport coat. I, I, I don't like to wear them. But you'd line your coat pockets with wax paper, and then you'd go to the wedding. Always, always, always to the Catholic Church, St. Patrick's. God bless those Irish, I tell you. And we go in there, they always ask the question back in the old days. Oh, what side are you? The bride or the groom? Like I would say, who cares? You know? But we always see who had the most, so we go to there. And if the bride was really pretty, we go to her side. But she was really not so pretty, you know. I was told one time all brides are pretty, some more than others. And so we go sit down and afterwards we go downstairs. Oh yeah, I knew that. I knew Margie. Oh yeah, I knew him real. Oh absolutely, you know. I knew him. We're good friends. Oh, the heck we were. But they would never check. They never check your ID. And we'd go down and boy at the Catholic Church they had meatballs. Or, you know, if it was Irish, oh my gosh, they had stew, sometimes they had roast lamb, or, or roast beef, or anything. We would line our pockets with all those goodies. It was good for a weekend. Sandwiches and stuff, you know, we do that all the time. Well, the same thing here, only the receptions didn't go on for an hour or two. They would go on all day, and then the next day, and then the next day. I've already uh, married off one of my daughters. I have another one coming up this year. And, you know, can you imagine planning a reception for four, five, six, seven, eight days? Can you imagine that? Well, that's what was going on in this story. Wow. But during the time of the celebration, the family runs out of wine. Well, of course they would. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. Sure, you're going out of wine. And so they gather together the, the, the jars, huge jars, 20, 30-gallon jars, uh, used for the rites of purification because they went through them as well. And if you want to know about that, I won't get into that, otherwise we'll be here another hour. Read the book of, of Leviticus and you'll, and you'll find out why you had all that water there, you know, for purification. And Jesus changed the water into wine. Wow! That's the story for today. Wow. But you have to understand, there was a little tata ta between Mama and Jesus, you know, and, and Jesus and Mary didn't really appreciate the attitude Jesus had. Now you gotta remember, this was Jesus' first miracle. This was his first. And so there it was. You know, I'm not ready yet, Mom. And then of course she said, do whatever he tells you. I'm putting a little emphasis on that. And Jesus got to him real quick. You better keep Mama happy. Always. It's always the case. I know if you're married, men, you gotta keep your mom happy. My wife is, is, is my mom. My mother was my mother and she bore me. But my wife keeps me happy and I gotta keep her happy. And 
So that's the dynamic going on here, see? But maybe, maybe that's not the point of the story. Do whatever it tells you. Can you imagine if, if the followers of Jesus took to heart that admonition? Imagine if we did everything Jesus told us to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. If anyone takes your coat from you, give them your shirt. Can you imagine? On and on and on. Wash another's feet? You bet. Don't judge others. Absolutely. Whatever Jesus says, you do it. Is that the point of the story? Hmm. Might be. That's number two. Well, Jesus does get involved. He tells us the servants to fill up the pots. They fill up the pot. The jars are full. He takes some out. They have the master of ceremonies there to test it, and it was the best. You heard the story. The water was wine. The best wine. Is that the point of the whole story? That Jesus, Jesus is some sort of magician? He's some sort of miracle worker? Wow! That's kind of exciting! That, this story kicks off the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Whoa! That's a good kickoff, wouldn't you say? I would say probably so. But if that's what John wants us to know about who this Jesus is, well, then we're in a whole new different story there. My question is now, what are we going to ask Jesus for? What do we ask him for? You know, gee, if you're in school, Lord, help me pass that test. You know, help me get a better job. Protect me when I drive on 205, because you do need protection on 205. You know, Lord, do this. Lord, do this. Lord, help me with that. Lord, do that. Wow. That's kind of a neat story if you could ask Jesus to do that, you know. If this is what we're here for today, to learn about John's story and what he has in store for us. Look, Jesus, help me. I think we get the point totally upside down. Now, if we're not going to do everything that Jesus asked us to do, Jesus is doing everything we tell him to do. Is that another main point? Maybe we can find a point, a, a real good point here in the response of the wedding hopes when he tastes the wine and says, Ah, everybody can taste there. This is wonderful wine. This is good stuff. The first one, where you get topsy turvy and then you give them the bad stuff. But if you save the best for last, is that the lesson here? Not just that Jesus turns all that water into wine. No. That it turns it into what? The best, excellent wine. Is it when Jesus touches people's hearts, ordinary people, that he makes them into extraordinary people? Wow, that's an excellent point. Woo! That when he's invited into a marriage, he turns what was a stale relationship into something phenomenal. That when Jesus infuses his life into somebody else's life, they can do astonishing things that they couldn't do before. Is that the lesson here for us? Hmm. I remember I, I was a youth pastor a thousand years ago. It seems like the Lord had mercy kind of both by so fast. I was a youth pastor in Milwaukee, Oregon, and we took 36 kids on a trip. In fact, it was amazing when I was thinking about what to say to you today. Somebody on that trip called me and was interested if I would be interested in having coffee with her. And that was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. But I remember we needed a, a one more adult chaperone. Man, we, you know, with all those kids, we needed a, at least one adult for each five or six kids. And, and so one young gal raised her hand in the church one day and says, I'd like to go. Her name was Denise. I never forget her. And she was kind of a nominal. She'd come to church once in a while. And this so happens that particular day she came and she rose her, raised her hand up. I'll go, what? That's the first time you've been here in three months. But she came. She came. We were actually gone on the road uh, for 
for almost two weeks, two buses. Lord have mercy. I went into the hospital immediately when I got, no, I didn't. I'm <laughs> <laughs> really proud of how many kids we had back in those days. But you know, she was so much involved with those kids, she began to pray with them. And she knew everyone by name after a while. And she prayed with them constantly. And she was a very, very wonderful youth director for so many years at that church. Until I left that church. She was amazing. You know? Maybe the point of the story is this, in relation to that story. Verse 11, And the first of the signs who came up Galilee revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. At that point, you know, in, in that, when, when Denise was at that trip, you know, I think at that point Jesus revealed himself to her. And she became a totally different person than when she was coming to church every three months. Amazing, amazing. Maybe John included that in his gospel here so his readers would begin to understand, even begin to understand. Not on one thunderous, huge, huge time, like all of a sudden you, you're zapped by lightning and you've got, you've got it. You are, now, you are now on the road to faith. No, no. What John was trying to say, maybe it was a gradual process, like that youth director, a gradual process to come into the church and recognize that Jesus is certainly Lord of their life. He turned water into wine. You bet he did. He healed a blind man. You remember the stories. He turned an outcast woman at the well into an amazing proclamator, proclamator of his love. He turned a little boy's lunch into a feast for 5,000. Wow! And still, still, after all this, all this stuff, when he calms the stormy sea and threatens to, the, threatens to sink his disciples, they curiously ask this question. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who even the winds and the waves obey him. Wow. Is that one of the points of the story? If they didn't understand who Jesus was after living with him for all those years, how can we come to know his power and his authority of the world that he created. So, here's my answer. I never did give my Bible study class the answer to what I, what I think would be the point of this story. But here it is. That if Jesus could do all this in one single story, take the whole story and put it into one little bundle, is it possible that Jesus could make a difference in you? Ponder that question. Is it possible that he could change your life if he could do all this in one story? Is it possible that he could take a marriage that's in trouble right now and with no counselors and no self-help books turn that marriage around? Could he do that? Yeah, you bet. Is it possible that instead of, you know, of having everything I want and wanting this and wanting this and wanting that, could Jesus curtail my appetite with that so that I want everything I have? Hmm. Could he give me a shorter fuse when we get into arguments? Really? I use that with a friend of mine. Too. I won't get into politics right now, but he was arguing over something. I said, you know, maybe my, my prayer for you isn't that you stop arguing, just give it a little shorter fuse. You know? Could it give me a, a, a longer memory of the promises that I've made? And a stronger love for those that I do love? Hmm. Is it possible Jesus could take the counterfeit life that we have settled for and give me a life perfect bring with possibilities? That's an interesting question. I'll have us go through life and set it for what life is good in us. Oh, I'm just a teacher. Oh, I'm just a this. Oh, I'm just a that. And there's so much more possibilities. Remember, I had a, a friend of mine come over and give a speech to our church years ago. And he said, Jesus is like that window over there. And that window had four panes in it. Four panes. 
you know, that pain up there, up there is, is what you think you are. This one over here is what your family thinks you are, which is different, by the way. One down here is what other people think of you, and the one over in the corner, that's what Jesus thinks about you. <clears throat> totally different oftentimes than what we have. So today, may you see this story as, as possibly a kickoff for a new direction of your life. I see it as a kickoff for a, a possibly, possibly, I would say, fact that it could be a kickoff for the way this congregation begins to look at itself. Oftentimes, we, as members of the Faithful Savior, by the way, I am a member. We look at it as, oh, we only have 32 today. We only have 38 today. We only have 27 today. Do you think of that? I don't think of that at all. I think of all the possibilities that we've got. Maybe we can use this story as a kickoff for possibility, a new story, a new, a new ministry that Faithful Savior can, can become a part of. And so my prayer is very simple. That, Lord, that you give us a glimpse of this Jesus who wants us wants to give us eternal life, abundant life, both now, tomorrow, and the kingdom to come. Amen. Amen. So may the peace of God which passes all our understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please stand.